proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and uh, I will begin and, and direct my first question to Mr. Spaulding. Uh, Mr. Spaulding, I noticed in your testimony that you referenced the 1688 Glorious Revolution and uh, the, the um, establishment of a legislative supremacy over the monarch. Um, could you elaborate on that, if that is the foundation by which uh, our founding fathers looked to when they wrote Article I in the Constitution? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the importance of, of the Glorious Revolution to the American Revolution is, is, is high. Uh, the long establishment of the rule of law through British constitutionalism culminates in the Glorious Revolution, which could only go so far. It established legislative supremacy. Having said that, that legislative supremacy used by Parliament against the Americans of the colonies was objectionable to them. Uh, the American um, founders pr uh, perfected this question by constructing a constitution of three co-equal branch, the legislative being first, but uh, with the powers we've talked about and the various checks on it, and the executive and the uh, judiciary through the separation of power system. So in other words, that, that was what the Founding Fathers, one of the things they looked at when they said they need to have a method to restrain an over-exuberant legislative branch that might have been all-powerful. It helped them bring that to the balance, uh, a balance of the three power branches of government. Uh, uh, it, and they did so by having a written constitution, which was the main di difference between the Glorious Revolution and the American Revolution. Indeed, and thank you. And then, so, I also wanted to pose another question to you, um, Mr. Spaulding, and that is that, do you believe that our founding fathers imagined that there would be an executive that would threaten to veto any legislation that didn't include all of his appropriations that he demanded in it, and, and in vetoing uh, that legislation would bring about a government shutdown? What did you imagine our founding fathers thought would happen if an executive uh, took that kind of a step, which we've seen in the last couple of years frequently? Well, the first thing to point out is the history of executive vetoes. Uh, were to be used rarely, only if uh, there were serious objections, mostly having to do with constitutional uh, disagreements with Congress. Um, the president has the right to choose uh, however he wants to, to veto. Uh, but the idea of using a constitutional power like the veto as a way to uh, essentially leverage uh, Congress to pass full budgets, um, I don't think they probably could have imagined that. But the main thing they could not have imagined is the massive shifting of a power within the separation of powers to the executive branch. Uh, the fact is that that forces the Congress, uh, in addition to its inability to pass its, its uh, appropriations bills, into massive omnibus bills at the last moment, which in turn give the executive massive amounts of authority to, to threaten the veto. Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. I'd like to turn then to Mr. Postel. And um, your testimony included, um, your testimony included uh, Article One uh, is not set up. Uh, you called it a non-delegation principle in Article One. Uh, so, take this non-delegation principle to its extreme for us. Uh, does that mean clawing back a lot of the things that are in the executive branch? Does that mean clawing back the rulemaking authority? Does that mean uh, reaching into the EPA and bringing uh, the operations out of there with the exception of the enforcement and field operations into the control of Congress? How do you envision this at its, uh, uh, say, taking it to the logical extreme? <coughs> yeah, uh, I think that it largely entails some of the things you're describing, which means not the abolition of any of these programs, not the abolition of any of these regulations, not the abolition of any of these agencies, but rather transferring certain authorities that have been given to those agencies back into the legislative branch. So for instance, uh, Congress set up multiple departments and multiple agencies from the very beginning, but those agencies and those departments were executive or administrative, which meant they had powers such as uh, investigation, prosecution, and enforcement, but they weren't lawmaking entities because that was fundamentally the job of Congress. So the rules that bind conduct have to be made by the legislative branch, otherwise we're not in a representative democracy anymore. Could a Congress then establish enforcement uh, forces to uh, carry out such actions? Uh, I think so, yes. That would be my conclusion from, from listening to this. I, I, just, I wanted to take it to that level uh, because this committee, this task force, I believe, wants to look at the full breadth of this so that we can come at uh, what is the reason judgment of, um, of, the, of the people, and we want to restore the power to the people in the end. So I, I just uh, quickly, um, Mr. Mr. Capretta, uh, the tools that Congress has to enforce today against an executive branch, uh, how long is that list and what are they? Uh, 
the, the uh, tools to uh, restrain executive spending authority, you mean? To restrain an executive branch, an over-exuberant executive branch that might be operating outside the Constitution. Well, uh, I think the budgetary powers should be restrained. So I would look at the list of programs that have permanent spending authority now, and some of that has been done by Congress. Most, I mean, that has been done by Congress. So I wouldn't put it necessarily in a constitutional question, but many statutes have delegated the spending authority to the Congress. Uh, I think it's just become a pattern and a practice over many, many years. And it was done originally for programs that had a benefit associated with it, and people wanted some certainty. But it's gone well beyond that to a lot of discretionary programs that are now getting mandatory funding, including agencies of government. I would target those first. Thank you, Mr. Capretta. My time is expired.